Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so uh, I'm Feng Zhao, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Carlos Gaston from CMU. So um, you have to profess it, right? Well, I have to say that. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, Carlos has been uh, doing uh, quite a number of uh, interesting uh, research. Um, that some of you are probably familiar, especially in the area of uh, machine learning, distributed inference, and uh, reasoning. And in particular, he has been uh, very interested in applying some of those techniques to problems of inference and uh, you know, data reasoning in uh, sensor networks. Um, I'm actually quite amazed by the list of things that uh, he has done, and including the uh, best paper awards that he had, uh, he had uh, won, he and his students had won. So I just mentioned a few. Uh, he and his students had received the best paid paper awards in the area of uh, machine learning, uh, data mining, and sensor networks uh, from uh, KDD, which is a Knowledge Discovery Data Mining Conference, IPSN, which is a sensor net conference, um, VLDB, which is uh, one of the top database conferences, and uh, NIPS, which is a uh, machine learning and the neural net conferences. And uh, there's a number of others that, uh, that he had uh, run up best paper awards, as well as uh, a each Kai JIR best paper award uh, in 2007. So that's a pretty impressive list of that. Um, Carlos did his PhD from Stanford in uh, 2003, and after that, he uh, wandered uh, through the Bay Area, uh, went up to uh, Berkeley, and uh, as a senior researcher in the uh, Berkeley Intel Research Lab. And after that, uh, he uh, became an uh, assistant professor in the CS department at uh, CMU, and, uh, which is a position he has been uh, holding till now. So um, with that, I will introduce uh, Carlos for a talk on uh, the robust sensor placement and optimization and the submodular functions. Thank you very much. The senior research part is kind of funny too. Interesting title. Um, thank you for having me. It's fun to be here. Uh, I'll talk about sensor placement problems and submodular functions. And this is really joint work with my student Andreas Krause, who you guys know was here uh, over the summer, and also joint work with a bunch of other people. The main people uh, were involved in some of the algorithmic stuff are Anupam Gupta, John Kleinberg, uh, Brandon McMahon. Ajit Singh, but there are others, and I'll mention others as we go along. So, if you think about the set of pipes that bring water to your tap, that's a pretty complicated system. And if you have pathogens in the system, then it can affect thousands or even millions of people. So, what we do right now is that we put chlorine at the source where the water comes, and we sit at home and we kind of hope for the best. So, to avoid this kind of problem, what the civil engineers want to do is install pipes, uh, sensors in the pipes to quickly detect pathogens and minimize the population affected. The problem is that each of the sensors costs about $5,000 and somehow local government is not so willing to buy a lot of these sensors. And so it's, it's so much the case there was this competition last year where we got a model of a city and a simulator from the EPA and we had to give back best sensor placements. So that's an interesting sensor placement problem. And thinking about water is not limited to pipes, but you can think about natural environments. So here's Lake Fomar in, in Southern California, where we're working with people in UCLA and USC at putting both mobile and static sensors in this environment since last year in order to uh, detect algae, um, algae, algae levels, monitor the algae biomass for something called algal blooms, which are basically come from different pollution that can come into the water. So sensor placement and motions of sensors are uh, important here. There's also lots of other applications that go beyond water. So for example, uh, here's a chair, the smart chair, that uh, was built, not this particular one, but was built by people at CMU. And the idea is can we use this chair to detect activity of the users on this chair to, for example, help aging population, make sure they're active, see what they're doing right now. Here's an image of, uh, you can take a guess. Uh, on the chair. But the problem is that the sensor that we're going to use is a pretty cool sensor. It has one pressure sensor per square centimeter, but uh, it costs about $10,000. So somehow I don't think Medicare is going to cover uh, this sensor over here. 
So what can we do about it? And we're kind of working on coming up with a chair that has a similar performance, but using many fewer and cheaper sensors. So these are all places where placing sensors make sense to monitor things like pathogen distributions, algae biomass, temperature and light fields in an environment, or maybe more importantly, your uh, rear end pressure in your chair. So for each one of these, we want to figure out how to best place sensors. And so what I'll talk about first is how to maximize the information that we get out of the sensors. And even before I talk about that, I'm going to talk briefly about how do we predict uh, spatial phenomena using sensors. So you can imagine deploying a bunch of sensors and measuring some temperature from them, and then using them to predict what the temperature is where Eric is sitting right now. This problem is called the regression problem. So basically, for a bunch of positions, I measure what the temperature is, and then I want to somehow interpolate this such that for some unknown location, I can tell you what the temperature is at this unknown location. So here's a, a picture of deployment that I did when I was at Intel. And here's what the temperature field looked at some particular time of the day when the sun was shining on that part. And if you look at it, this area where I predicted high temperatures, there's lots of sensors there. So somehow I think my prediction is good. But how many people believe the prediction in this other area where I wasn't allowed to put sensors because there was some elevator and some things that didn't let me put sensors? Somehow I don't trust my prediction there. So what I want to know is how to find good placements where I can trust my prediction everywhere. And this is what we're trying to do. So back to the picture that we had before, there's some locations that had more sensors and some that I can trust more, some locations that I can trust less, and somehow I want to minimize the uncertainty throughout the environment. So I want to minimize how sh the, the uncertainty in my predictions. So the pictorially, what we have is we have a regression model on the left, and we have set set sensor locations on the right. If I combine these, I have a notion of uncertainty. So this is the variance in my prediction. And the area that I had lots of sensors, I have low variance, where the area that had few sensors, I can not trust my prediction, I have higher variance. And somehow I uniformly, sorry, uniformly want to minimize this variance. So the, the way we model this spatial processor with things like Gaussian processes and non-parametric models, and I won't talk too much about that, I'll talk about the optimization part today. So the optimization part is, given a set of placements A, I get some picture about the information that I get, or the certainty, <coughs> and I can imagine for some places, placements that are good, maybe I get 10 points, and for some placements that are bad, maybe I get only 4 points. And I want to maximize the number of points that I get. So the way we measure this is in terms of the entropy of this posterior distribution, but I won't talk too much about that. But just think about each placement has a number of points associated with it. And so if I go to Walmart or, or I go to Radio Shack and I buy a box of 10 sensors, and when I maximize the amount of information, subject to the part that I only use these 10 sensors. And this problem has been around for a long, long time. And it's an NP hard problem. And most, you know, the existing methods have no quality guarantees. But before, you know, we talk about this issue, let's look at maybe the simplest heuristic. Or maybe it's the second simplest, okay, one of the simplest heuristics. And it's the greedy algorithm. I put a sensor out in some location that gives me most information. And then I put the next sensor out in a location that gives me most additional information. And the next one at a location that gives me most additional information and so on. So this is like simple greedy algorithm and you can imagine uh, running this on a particular placement. But if you knew that I was placing four sensors, then there is another setting, another organization of sensors that gives me more information. So greedy is suboptimal. But if you look at this picture, it doesn't look so bad. Greedy doesn't look so bad in this picture. It does a, you know, similar to what the optimal solution was. And in fact, if I look at real data, greedy does extremely well. So here's for the water distribution system. If I run the optimal algorithm selecting five placements out of 43 positions, and I run greedy, I get exactly the same answer. And if I let greedy pick from more locations, I get an even better answer. If you look at the, water temp uh, uh, sorry, at the temperatures in the building, if I put greedy into 12 locations, this is the amount of information I get. If I write a simulated annealing algorithm with random restarts and lots of fancy tricks, I get 3% better. Yeah, so we use, 
yeah, we run the model to, for every possible attack, we run the model to completion. There is a, more than a million simulations there underneath. We cache. There's some really interesting ways of computing this kind of thing fast, and I don't talk about that at all. But yeah. So if you do something really fancy, you only get 3% better. So the question is why? why? Why is this the case? And just to understand why, the, the, the point here is that by the time I was doing badly with greedy, was when I was putting the force sensor, there wasn't that much information left. So when I start doing badly, I do badly in a little bit, so doing badly in the whole space. This notion is formalized by something called diminishing returns. So if I add a new sensor S to a small deployment, then it may help me a lot. But if I add a sensor S to a bigger deployment, then it helps me less. So adding a sensor to a larger set helps me uh, less than adding it to a smaller set. This is, this is formalized by something called submodular functions. Submodular functions are really cool. So if there's only one thing you get out of this, it's like submodular functions are cool. So if I have a, the definition is if I have a set A, which is a subset of B, and I add a sensor location X, then it helps me more on the smaller set than it does on the bigger set. But if we go back to the placement problem, what we're saying is as I add more and more sensors, the advantage goes down. <coughs> that this function here is a concave function. And you can prove lots of cool things about it. So for example, if the advantage between two consecutive sensor placements is small, that means you're close to optimum. And that's pretty interesting. And it also lets you prove theorems like the result of greedy as compared to the optimal thing, which is NP-hard to get, is at most a constant factor of 63% away. Just because you identified the fact that it's a submodular function. Yes? Does this theorem depend on k or it's independent even for a very small k to hold? It holds for any k. So for all k, this relation holds. Yeah? So is this 1 minus 1 over e? Is uh, like not Nemhauser at all? This is Nemhauser at all plus, um, so, so far, it's Nemhauser at all plus some extra tricks because the problem that we have is not quite exactly submodular in the same way that Nemhauser requires. But I can tell you that offline. This is the fine print that goes here. But the, the, the result builds on Nemhauser at all so far. So it's not submodular, the function that you're optimizing. The function is submodular. Okay, let, can, we, can we just talk about that after? Yeah. It's, uh, there's some technical conditions that Nemhauser requires that we're not exactly satisfied here so far. But uh, the, the result holds and it builds on them Hauser. So if you know about that, there's nothing new so far, really. Um, but the idea of identifying submodular functions lets you do many, many cool things. Um, so for example, if you look at the water network for, that were given to us from the competition, they had many objectives they wanted us to optimize for. These were all submodular object objectives. And if because of some modular objectives, when I compare the greedy solution with the offline bound, you see that we can prove something about the quality of our solution. But you can also use some modular functions to obtain what are called online bounds. So given a particular solution that I have so far, I can say something about its quality. And that's what the, the green line is. So a posteriori, I can have tighter bounds than the 1 minus 1 over E bound. And you can use those bounds, for example, in a branching bound algorithm. You can also use some modularity to design faster, what we call lazy heuristics, to compute uh, your solutions faster. And I don't, I'm not going to talk about this too much. But I'll talk a little bit about the competition. So the competition was held last year. And it was multi-criteria optimization competition. And in the end, they decided everybody was a winner. So they decided they were not going to declare a winner. And, um, and then they wrote a paper about the competition this year and where they use some criterion at the end of the paper to evaluate everybody in the list. And here's a table from their paper. And, uh, you know, thankfully, we're, we're uh, nicely on top of the table. So by exploiting some modularity and designing faster algorithms that use it, uh, we came up better than the other people that were there. What's the metric? The metric is this metric. They count they, 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 they built a bunch of different scenarios and they saw how many times you won over the other ones and the number of non-dominated solutions. 
is what they, they mentioned as the, as the criteria. That's what they did in their paper. This is the organizer's summary of the competition. So, uh, we also looked at building smart chairs. So we actually built one of these chairs. We evaluated with 20 naive subjects and got about 87% accuracy on the solution and got something that was much cheaper. This cost about $100 of sensors as opposed to the expensive sensor that was on the left there. And in terms of quality of the solution, we saw that with smart sensor placement, we can get uh, pretty much optimal solution with very few sensors. We don't need all the 4,000 sensors which are implied by that sheet. And just to give you a picture, this is kind of cute. The, these are the sensors that we selected. These are the positions that we selected with, the, with our algorithm. And if you look at them, they're, they're non-intuitive. They're not uniformly displaced on the space. And I think it's because most people are right-handed. They kind of lean on one side of the chair more than other, maybe. That's my intuition. I don't have quite a solution. But just by placing them in a smart way, you got much better accuracy. Were the, um, when you say you reached 87% of the accuracy of the other, uh, of, the, of the full edge, do you mean in terms of some classification task? Or do you mean? The classification tasks, there were 10 different postures. Okay, and we, we tested on not the same subject, but on other subjects. So we cross validated with respect to subjects that were not part of the training data. Okay. If you learn and test on the same subject, it's a, very, it's a pretty easy problem. Yeah. yeah. So this is all about motivating submodular functions in terms of these applications. And I think that the, the fact is, it's a cool way of thinking about the problems and it allows us to design really interesting and effective algorithms. And I'll talk a little bit more about a couple of other algorithms. So the, the next setting we were thinking about is that we want to displace sensors, we want to put sensors in an environment like this building or in a lake in Southern California and somehow putting cables across the lake to all sensors doesn't seem like a reasonable thing to do. And we might want to consider the the communication part of sensing. So not just maximizing information, but minimizing the cost of communication. So here's a picture. What happens if I use the greedy algorithm in a, in a building? So if I put my first sensor in the left, in the upper left, what do you expect the next sensor to be if I want to maximize information? So somehow far away, right? So somehow down here. And the next one, and the next one, and I, I put four sensors in the environment, now they can't talk to each other because they're so far away. What do I do? Maybe I go to Radio Shack and I buy two more sensors and I make sure that they can talk through this relay node. But if I knew we were placing four sensors, then i will put them maybe a little closer together, get a little less information, but not have to go to Radio Shack at all. So in other words, if I want to maximize communication, then I just keep the sensors in a bag and never take them out. But they give me bad information, while if I want to get lots of information, then I spread them out and, and I have to go and buy extra sensors. And somehow we want to optimize this trade-off. So last year we, uh, we developed an algorithm we call PSPIL, which provides an effective solution to this and provides guarantees both in terms of the information quality that you have and the communication cost. They're both close to optimal. But we actually built this and have deployed the real sensor network using it. And I'll show you the results in a bit. So here's my quick overview of what the problem statement is. I want to Minimize the communication cost subject to the information quality of the sensors being at least Q. And the algorithm, just briefly, what it does is something uh, quite interesting. It takes the nodes and it clusters the nodes into clusters which are sufficiently far apart from each other but not very large. And then it runs the greedy algorithm within each cluster to prioritize what the nodes are. Then it uses something called the K minimum Steiner tree algorithm to figure out how to select the appropriate nodes in the clusters and connect them together. Unfortunately, covering the details of this algorithm takes me an entire talk, so I'm not going to go into details, but I'm happy to ask, answer questions afterwards about it. In this case, the C1 is not covered. No, no, but uh, C1, you don't need to visit C1 because it's predicted from the sensors that were picked from the other because of the correlations. So the clusters, that means that you have to cover the clusters. It's just a way of breaking up the problems into sub-problems. And then Kim, Steve, figures out how to combine them. So 
Um, as I said, this is an intuition of what the algorithm looks like. Uh, we did prove properties of this algorithm, so our information quality that we get is within a constant factor, and the communication cost is no more than a logarithmic factor worse than what the optimal NP-hard problem would be. So the picture here is that we start with some model from some uh, initial data from some expert model. We use it to learn the computer information qualities and communication costs. We optimize the deployment. We deploy sensors and maybe we repeat this uh, second step and continue if we want to do it again. So here's a, an example of going, building a sensor network, putting this, uh, getting them to collect data and deploying them in the building. So basically what we did was take this building, we deployed a set of initial sensors, we built some models, uh, we came up with some optimized deployment, and then we evaluated them. Here's a, a picture of uh, what happened there. So he, here's some sensors being deployed, and this is at CMU in the architecture building. And what we did was we took uh, one of the civil engineering students that works in this building, who was working with me, went around and placed some sensors in locations that he thought were natural for this place. So we're more or less uniformly spaced, where he thought it would be good to place sensors. And this is our, what we want to compare against, what an expert would do in some sense. And then for this placement, we measured how good it was at predicting light levels and how good it was at predicting communication costs. Sorry, at uh, how, how low the communication cost was. And then we ran our algorithm. Okay, so, so here's the disclaimer, right? So uh, you've probably written papers before, right? You have written papers before. This was like a few days before the deadline. We, we knew that uh, if we deploy the sensors, we didn't have time to do multiple deployments for this particular deadline. We run the algorithm. This is what it tells us to do. So um, we can't surprise, right? So we, we go, uh, go over the code. It was late at night, of course. We go over the code, didn't find any bugs. Then we say, okay, let's go over the theory. We didn't find any problems. So we finally said, okay, let's just deploy it and see what happens. This is the quality of the solution that we got. And by the way, the algorithm said, I don't need 20, I just use 19. We got much better prediction and even lower communication cost than the original deployment. And in fact, you could ask the algorithm to give me, use less sensors, so we ask it to use 12 sensors in the deployment. This is what it told us to do. And uh, it got even lower communication cost and better prediction than the manually placed 20 sensors. Then we wanted to understand why. Why is this the case? And so, it turns out that this is a beautiful, beautiful place. It has really uniform night, very nicely designed. During the day, the light is beautiful and uniform. What do we know about beautiful, uniform light? Easy to predict, right? One sensor anywhere would be enough. At night is when the action happens, when people turn lights on and off and all the variation happens. And this part of the building was some classrooms that were not used at night. And the other ones were the offices where were used at night. So the algorithm picked up on that without us expecting. And we got 50% less prediction error with 20% less communication cost for the 19, or 20% better prediction, 40% less communication cost for 20. But the interesting thing is that poor placements can be can hurt, and the good solutions can be unintuitive. Um, when you did the optimization, like, what was the base data against which you did that? I mean, did you have like a sensor grid to, to tell you what the light levels were? So, so we, we had collected a little bit of data in the beginning and we fit some Gaussian process models for the communication and for the light data but too. How, how did you fit the initial light? Was it just another other random deployments that you did by hand or? Yeah, it was uh, some other random deployment by okay. hand. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Yes. Yes. Which is basically what you don't want to do, but it was some random deployment by hand in the beginning. Um, yeah. um, seeing that you are measuring the quality of solution by say least square error, but then you're trying to minimize, uh, minimize the uncertainty with yeah. the variance. And connecting these two things is kind of, I mean, there is a gap between those, right? There is you a gap. You want to minimize uncertainty, but you care about 
is the quality of solution. Right. So if you, if you minimize something called the predictive variance, yeah. which is the A optimality criterion, if you know what that is, yeah. it's, uh, it's uh, in some sense related to squared error. We actually didn't optimize A optimality here, so there was a gap there. But we could have optimized, we could have done A optimality, which would have been directly related to RMS. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the question would be, would it be submodular? Right, so A optimality in general is not submodular. Yeah. That's why we don't optimize it. But uh, there is a paper that says that under, uh, by Kemp and uh, Bass, I think, that says that um, under some assumptions, uh, predictive variance is submodular. That paper came after what, the work that we did here. I'm thinking of those cases where your algorithm can be really confident, like the variance is very, very low on something completely incorrect. I mean, you might. Right. So, so, like so, if the model is that is wrong, then this can happen. <laughs> if the model is not wrong, then this cannot happen. Yeah, so that's a different problem. Yeah, it's a zero set. Right. We're optimizing with respect to this particular model. But uh, that brings me exactly to the next point, which is great. So there's two issues here with this, uh, this stuff that you ha probably haven't seen before. So the first is, I, I talked about ignoring this part, but what happens if the usage pattern changes? What would I do? If, I, if that gets used overnight, I'm not going to get anything out of it. And if I, if I have a uh, deployment of sensors in the pipe, in the pipes of, uh, and the adversary knows where the t pipe is, then they'll know exactly what to place the, sense, the, the contaminant in order to make us vulnerable. So we want to be robust against changing parameters, which is what you're talking about, if I don't believe my model, and we want to be robust against adversaries in our function. And the question is, how do we do that? And I'll talk about Saturate, which is a very simple but very effective algorithm for doing robust sensor placements. And this is something that we have at NIPS this year, upcoming NIPS. So, here, here is the next part. How do we think about robust sensor placements? So the idea so far is the following. I have a set of sensing locations A, and if the adversary attacks a location I, so puts contaminant at location I, then I have a function f of I that measures what the population protected was by this set of sensors. And I'm trying to maximize the population protected. And f I is a submodular function. And what we did for the competition is optimize the sum over i on some probability distribution over attacks of fi. So the average. And the average, or even the weighted average, is still submodular. So we're OK. But in an adversarial setting, we don't want to optimize the average. We want to optimize the worst case. We want to optimize the minimum, the worst case attack, over all these possible submodular functions. And this problem is not submodular. Why not? I mean, can't you choose? Can't you choose the PI that just places a delta function at the worst place? But the worst place depends on, on A. So, yes, there is a P, for, for each A there is a PI, but as a function of A, this is not submodular. <coughs> so just to give you a sense of what, what the problem is, here's a, here's a simple example. We have two people, and the painter on top uh, likes, you know, a palette, has some preference for lemonade and fruit, but it's not that interested in the camera. Well, the person on the bottom is very interested in the camera because he's a photographer, but not so much on the palette. So, if we're doing the optimal thing and picking two objects, then we'd pick the camera and the palette. But if we use the greedy algorithm to m optimize the minimum of the two, what would be the first object that we'd pick? If I pick the camera, the minimum is still zero because the painter is not going to be happy at all. I would either pick the lemonade or the fruit because they give you an excellent increase for everybody. So I'd first pick the, for example, the lemonade, then I'll pick the fruit, and then I get only two epsilon as opposed to one. So the greedy algorithm here would do arbitrarily badly. Does that make sense? And so you might think, so being greed is bad. Maybe there's another algorithm for this problem that's smarter. So we tried to find a better algorithm, and this is what we proved. We said that unless p equals np, there is no polytime approximation algorithm that can solve this max-min problem for case sensors. Yeah, well, 
there's more coming. But, but, wait. but wait, yes. <laughs> I'll not stop here. That, that'll be kind of boring, right? <laughs> uh, so for a particular set of case sensors, if I want to place case sensors, there's no approximation algorithm for any factor, polynomial factor, constant factor, any factor you could possibly think about. And so what do we do? So if we're optimizing the sum, let's say there's two functions, f1 and f2. And you have a1 that gives you three points on f1, a2 gives you three points on f1, and a3 gives you one point on f2. If I optimize the sum of f1 plus f2, then I'll first pick a1, then I pick a2, and I get five points for the sum. But that does nothing for f2. The minimum is still zero. So optimizing the sum and optimizing the, the minimum are quite different. But here's what's, what's at NIPS. Here's the, here's the cool insight. Suppose that I truncate all of my functions to be smaller than some magical value, which is the worst case value. Let's say one. This is the worst case value. If I knew that value, what could I do? So I'm going to go and chop off three and say this is the only value of one. Then I'm going to chop off two and say this is the most one. And then I'm going to take my first greedy step. So my first greedy step is going to optimize the sum of the two truncated functions. So I first select A1, and then I say, oh, I can't get any more value out of F1. So how much is A2 worth for me now? Nothing. It's not worth anything anymore. So I chop that out, and then what I do is I pick A3. So by optimizing the sum of these two truncated functions, F, uh, truncated meaning the, I'm going to let it be at most C and never be higher than C for any set A, I can use a greedy algorithm to obtain a solution. If you go back to the, the painter and the photographer case now, though, it, it's different, but it, it, makes, like, it, it makes the things that are worth epsilon look no better or worse than the things that are worth one, right? Because they're all truncated at that epsilon value now. No, no, they'll be truncated at the one value. I'll be optimizing the sum of the two. So I'd first pick the, the paint because that gives me most for the sum, and then I pick the lemonade, the, the palette. You see? I'm optimizing F1 plus F2. That's the difference. If I knew the truncation value, I'd optimize F1 plus F2. So, in other words, I, I, see if I knew the, the worst case value C, the thing that I can achieve, I can define these functions for each person or for each attack Fi of C as something that gets no bigger than C. So it's Fi until you get to C and then I get no bigger. And this function, truncated function, is still a submodular function. So here's the, this, the simple trick. What do I do? I optimize the sum of these truncated functions. I truncated them, I optimize their sum, and I know that if I achieve on average C value, since each function can't get bigger than C, that means that everybody has achieved the value C. So if I maximize the sum, everybody gets happy by the value C. So how do we optimize the sum such that we cover C, such that we achieve C? Unfortunately, this is called a covering problem. It's also an empty hard problem. But uh, there is an approximation algorithm for it, which is the greedy approach. And the greedy approach says that I'm going to achieve something that is at least as good as opt if I use alpha times k sensors. Not just k, but I use a little bit more. One plus log of some factor, more sensors. So if you wanted to deploy 10 sensors, I'm going to say you now have to deploy 12 sensors. And by deploying 12 sensors, you can achieve C. That make sense? So that's with respect to knowing C. But of course, we don't know the value of C. So what's the natural thing to do? Some uh, binary search is the natural thing to do here. So the algorithm is extremely <coughs> simple. For each binary uh, search value C, I compute the truncated functions. I use the greedy alg algorithm to cover the truncated function. If I use more than alpha k sensors, then I've used too many, so C is too large. And if I use fewer than alpha k sensors, then C is too small, I could do better. I can deploy more sensors. And the simple algorithm, which we call saturate, achieves a value which is at least as good as opt and uses alpha more sensors than k.
So here's the picture. We have this algorithm that uses 1 plus log of something more sensors than k. And we have this negative result on top that says no approximation algorithm exists at all when you want to use k sensors. So the question is, that there exists an algorithm that's better uh, unless p equals np, I guess. How many people leave p equals np? Uh, uh, can I do something better? Can I get less than sensors the 1 plus log something? And uh, the answer is slightly more complicated. But if you want to use anything smaller than 1 plus log, anything better than that, then np is uh, d time n to the log log n. That means that you can solve np hard problems in n to the log log n times. And uh, I don't know how many of you believe, but uh, log log n is a pretty small number. So if you can si solve np hard problems in this time, then uh, you'll be pretty lucky, I think. So it's very unlikely they can achieve anything better than what our algorithm does. So this is what we have at NIPS. <laughs> this is a NIPS paper. Yeah. Um, so in terms of quality of solutions, just to give you a sense of, of what happens, clearly, if I consider the worst case attack, optimizing for the average gives you worse result than optimizing for the worst case. I'm measuring the worst case error, optimizing for the worst case does much better. That's maybe no surprise, right? But the question is how conservative is optimizing for the worst case? How bad can it be? And this is the picture. So if I think about the average attack, optimizing for the average does better than optimizing for the worst case, but doesn't do that much better if you compare this gap with this gap over here. In other words, optimizing for the worst case doesn't hurt your average performance too much which is actually pretty cool and surprising. So the idea is the real adversary has these analyses. Uh, the idea, and, and so they'll decide not to go and attack us at all. Is that what you're saying? Well, try something else. Well, but if they could try something else, then P, NP is like a log N to the log log N. So that's enough to convince anybody, right? <laughs> yeah, but maybe they'll attack some other system that we're not protecting. And I can't say anything about that. Uh, and um, of course, in to, to just understand, you know, our algorithm is extremely simple. It's binary search on top of truncation, on top of greedy. How does it compare to some state-of-the-art min-max problems? So we found min -ma something called min-max Krieging, which is a uh, min-max optimization of the kind of sensor placement problem that I said in the beginning of the talk. And it's been around for quite a long time. And the state of the art is uh, this paper by Wayne's in 2005 that had seven hand-tuned parameters uh, and used simulated annealing on top of this. And uh, here's the results of our algorithm. So uh, we're this blue line here. Simulated annealing is this green line. So this simulated annealing with seven hand-tuned parameters does worse than us, than our very simple algorithm. And in terms of running time, uh, so the running time of simulated annealing is here, running time of our algorithm is down here. So we're much, much faster and do better than the state of the art on one of the potential applications of this algorithm. And we, we showed the, on the paper we also showed other applications like learning <coughs> under parameter pers perturbation and, um, and some other problems. Saturated plus simulator annealing? Means you take the solution of saturate and then you feed it as a starting point of simulated annealing and you can see if it does better. And so it turns out the simulated annealing can find a slightly better solution in some examples, but I'm not sure I trust that kind of significance at all. But it's the obvious question to ask next, right? Can we improve our solutions with some heuristic like this one? And we couldn't. And we also visited the, the Kishpil deployment based on the historical data from what we did. And here's the, the, where I showed you before, quality of the solution and cost. But we can also measure the, the kind of mean max error. And you can see the manual deployment, because it's uniform, 
it has better worst case error if the parameters get perturbed. And here, with perturbation, we use a pretty large perturbation. But if we use PSPL combined with the saturate idea, or we're calling now robust PSPL, and this is not anywhere, this is like fresh off the press kind of results, uh, we get a deployment that looks like this. So it decides to take some of the sensors that were on the right and move it to the left side of the lab, kind of just in case things change. And this result has better worst case performance, even than the uniformly spread result. It has lower uh, cost, communication cost, than the uniformly spread result, a little bit worse than this one. And you can see why the sensors are more spread out. And it has better prediction accuracy on average than the manual placement. So the average performance is a little bit worse than the thing that was optimized for average, but not that but much better still than the, than the one that we deployed manually in this intuitive way. Which is actually pretty cool. So just to wrap up here, um, we've looked at some other settings that I, I thought some questions would, would show up. And this is just kind of plugs. So we looked at when we do the deployments in the lake, we have sensors on boats to move around. So we looked at optimizing the paths of multiple boats in order to collect the most information. So how to maximize the information collected by union of this path such that each path is less than some amount. And we also looked at uh, ICML this year at the active learning problem. So, it, so far we've assumed there is a known model of the environment. And this is a bad assumption. Bad assumption, bad assumption. And we somehow went to walk to a lake, know nothing about the lake, and learn something about the lake as we're optimizing the locations of the sensors in the lake. And we have some, an active learning algorithm with theoretical guarantees that exploits some modularity as well. So just to give you a quick idea, if I have an a priori model of the lake, I'm not going to do as well if I do active learning as I'm doing sensor placement on this lake, which is this uh, better RMS error here. So this is a lake-specific model that we're learning, and this is an a priori model. Uh, how the active learning works? Yeah, so we have two parts. One part that talks about, it's what we call the explore, we call it uh, an exploration and exploitation analysis. So exploration, we're trying to learn the parameters of the lake, and exploitation is given the parameters we, we, uh, we decide how to place the sensors. And so we have some theoretical results about how many samples you need. But you, you apply some to that decision? Uh, we apply, so the, the exploration phase, we use something based on some hypothesis testing approach. The bound depends on submodularity. We use some hypothesis testing approach to the exploration, and I can talk about how that works. And uh, the exploitation fi phase uses some modularity. When you say you're refining the model, I'm assuming it's based on loss and as well, and you're yeah. learning the kernel parameters? You're learning the kernel parameters. In fact, here we learn a non-stationary Gaussian process. So the kernel parameters vary with space. Yeah, there's a, so th th this here uh, is the San Joaquin River. And there's a confluence with, uh, uh, I think, Merced, Merced River, right? And um, as they come together, one is the darker river, and the other one is lighter. And so you see the dark water mixing with the lighter water. And so the variability of the GP, of the Gaussian process parameter, there in the part which is clear water, in the part that's dark water, the process doesn't vary as much, but in the mixing part, it varies. So the correlations are, uh, the, the kernel parameters are wider in the, near the banks, and they're narrower near the middle. And so we kind of learn that structure directly from data as, we're, as we do the active learning. Are you kind of like kernel alignment, or it's more of a... You know, uh, how, how, the, how the algorithm works? Yeah. It's a, it, we use a hierarchical base algorithm. Base, base. Yeah, basically. So we have a prior over parameters and we marginalize those out here. Sorry, I should have done more of the talk on this if you're interested, but I'm happy to answer more afterwards. Yeah. Oh, that sounds good. Um, and so just uh, to conclude, I think a big message is the submodular functions are cool. And if you want to learn more about those, I think you can do really, really interesting things. 
It's, it's like a new kind of problem structure in a way that you can exploit it and do interesting things with it. For simple settings, we have to do a greedy algorithm, but for more complicated settings like communication costs, adversary paths, and so on, you have to go beyond greedy, but you continue to exploit some modularity. Um, the approaches I describe are all in terms of sensor placement problems, but really these are observation selection problems, or feature selection problems, or experimental design problems. These are different names for the kind, same kind of problem. And as I said, it's pretty cool that the algorithms actually work on real world problems and have theoretical guarantees, and that's really fun. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So you talked about uh, spatial sensor placement. What about um, uh, temporal placement? So let's say like you want to measure light levels, but you want to conserve batteries, so you don't want to have the sensor running all the time. Is that just a trivial extension? Uh, there's two versions of this extension. Uh, one, one is I'm, I have a set of deployments and I just want to figure out where to turn on, which ones to turn on at what time, right. and that's a more or less trivial extension. That's like a uh, location cross time, and we have uh, we actually have a paper on how to speed that up and make it really efficient over time if your process is Markovian. But there's an even more interesting one, which is when you place a sensor, you have, not interesting, but related, when you place a sensor, you get a column. So if you imagine this is the temporal line, if I place a sensor, I get measurements on all this time steps, because I'm not going to move different sensors over time. <coughs> but uh, you don't want to turn on at every time step. So you want to simultaneously optimize where you place the sensor and when it's going to be turned on. And that problem is more interesting, I think, and we have some ideas on that one. We have people that talked about it, um, but I think that's a more interesting setting. You see, you see what I mean by the difference? Yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.